Welcome back everybody to the employer stage. Um, we've had two awesome sessions so far, lots of really valuable insights. Definitely be sharing some of that after this session. Last session in here today um, is Bridging the Gap, Collaborating with Academia for Tech Talent Success. I'm Sam Wheeler, I'm gonna be your host for today. I've been working in this industry for about 20 odd years, uh, currently working for a company called Big Lemon, and we are all about tech with purpose, building digital products that go in the wild and do good things. Um, so I feel very passionate about bridging this gap between uh, industry and the academia. I think it's such an important role and it has come up already quite a lot in the discussions. So chairing this session is uh, John Platz, who's the Dean of Cardiff School of Technologies at Cardiff Met Uni. They've got a stand outside as well, so feel free to go and find them after this session and have a little chat. John's got a fantastically eclectic background himself. Um, he's worked for the UK Royal Air Force and worldwide industry research and development as well. He's also got commercial success in running his own company, so lots to offer for sure. And in this session, um, we'll be uncovering the power and potential of partnering with academia and in turn recruiting some of the brightest minds in tech. So we're bridging that gap between education and employment. That's me done, over to you, John. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Boradar, everyone. Um, I have to say, as bouncy castles go, this is a little bit to, to be desired. But anyway, um, I'm just going to keep you two or three minutes to set the scene for my colleagues over on the left here. Um, but we're looking to discuss the benefits uh, of industry working hand in hand with academia. And so there are many benefits that accrue from academic partnerships. And it's a good way to get broad and deep expertise deployed on one's respective wicked problems. This might be recruiting those with the right skills, developing those skills in the workplace, influencing an industry-aligned curriculum, and building teams to attract grant funding. I'm sure we'll cover those in our, in our discussion. But here in Wales, we need to compete on a global stage. I have no doubt we can do this, and I don't need to talk about its importance to us all. There is a very real skills gap, and we all need to continually work to close that gap and raise our collective skills to address it. The HE sector is constantly evolving. My own school of technologies was established as a computer science and engineering school in February of 2018. We've grown from around 300 students across undergraduate, postgraduate study and research to as of September this year, just past our five year anniversary, around 1200 students, including more than 40 PhD students and around 100 permanent and part-time staff. So our vibrant local and globally connected research community is currently clustered around data science and AI, cybersecurity and information networks, blockchain and distributed technologies, digital society, electronics, sensors and systems, sustainability and bioengineering. And that's reflected across all the universities in, in Wales. Across Wales and just over the border, there are university groups that cover similar topics and we are blessed in the UK with having world-class universities. As I've said, many of our staff are international and collaborate as a matter of course with global teams. Engagement with those academics potentially helps industrial expansion into overseas markets. The university reason for being is to develop skilled graduates and offer research and innovation services. Connections within the local, national and global industrial and business community are essential, so this panel is designed to encourage all of you with needs to reach out to us. University teams are always happy to discuss jo um, joint opportunities and to involve external partners in all school developments. This goes for all universities. This could be developing training opportunities for specific technical certifications and qualifications, or equally engaging with our researchers to explore partnering opportunities to access grant and innovation funding. Having worked in industry, I recall the challenge of finding the appropriate access point for university expertise. Please let us know if you are in a similar situation or just uni curious. Let's kick off the questions, but before I do that, I'm going to sit down here with the microphone, but can I ask the panel to go along the line and just give us a very brief introduction to their background and their interests. Let's kick off with Alex. Hello. 
Oh, it does work. Um, Alex Jones, not from one show, if you are asking. Um, yeah, so I'm representing sort of Oldmore Bank. I'm the IT service supplier manager. I head up the IT supplier management function for, for Oldmore Bank and its group subsidiary companies. Um, uh, I've got a really invested um, position in this space. I brought a lot of people in from sort of different backgrounds. I've been involved in the um, sort of apprenticeship program and bringing people in. I've managed um, IT operational teams and now move on to, um, I now oversee like a lot of our critical and material IT vendor man uh, vendors for the bank um, and working on that strategy of how we work in a hybrid model of where we have in-house capabilities and also outsource that to um, particular uh, vendors and also our tall estate. Um, so yeah, really interested in kind of this overall disc um, discussion and about how we talk about skills and people and how we foster that in a kind of diverse tech landscape. Hi everybody, I'm Tara Williams and I work for Cardiff Met and I look after degree apprenticeships. So essentially I work with industry um, to bring people in to study with us um, via an apprenticeship route, which is relatively new for us as a university and also new for Wales as well. Thanks, Dara. Hi everyone, I'm Nick Johnson. I'm the Head of Employer Engagement at Cardiff Met. I'm not based to a particular school. I'm in, situated in student services and employability and work with all of the de uh, degree programmes and areas of Cardiff Met to hopefully help our students find jobs. But one of the things I'm particularly passionate about and hopefully we'll be able to get into a little bit today is the way that uh, organisations, employers can operate and work with universities to hopefully help build them uh, a recruitment pipeline and uh, work well for them and obviously work well for our students and graduates. Thank you, Nick. Uh, um, everybody, good morning. Um, my name is Jason Williams. I'm the Deputy Dean of School. Um, so I work very closely with John. Um, I've been in Cardiff Met for about 20, 25 years. Um, it sometimes feels like it, but I've seen a lot of change over that time um, and I've enjoyed being involved in the, in the growth of the school um, since we started about six years ago. Yeah. So yeah, good morning. I, I should perhaps explain, there was a picture that appeared over Jason's shoulder there of Fiona. Fiona couldn't join us, so Jason is Fiona today, just so you're, you're aware. So um, I talked about uh, skills and research and innovation, so we'll, t we'll f turn first to skills in general, and, I, and I'd like to ask Alex to kind of set the scene a little bit for us. So uh, can you talk about what it means to be technical or work in tech? And perhaps you could touch on a range of careers in technology. Yeah, absolutely. So I have found that if you were to ask me if I'm technical, I would say no. I would say I work in tech and I work with very gifted technical people. Um, and I think there's a bit of a distinguishedness between that. Um, uh, the way um, tech works, I think, for a lot of companies now is it's almost a its own business model that sits in parallel with what businesses are trying to achieve. So, for example, as part of Oldermore Bank, our CTI function is enormous. It's diverse. It's got a lot of skill sets um, to it. And you... And what a key to what we see our success is, is how we identify all the various skills to develop what is meaningful value. Tech, tech is there to give us... Um, true like an, an outcome it's either there to give us convenience it's there to protect us it's there to take us down a particular journey so um for us as well like tech where it previously was you know a technician that's on the other end of a screen or the other end of a phone it's not like that these days they're in the room and we're all playing a, a significant part um so when we talk about partnershiping with academia a lot of the time the skill set falls in about the collaboration piece tech capabilities are very wide um, and there's a lot you can do with it but it's got to it's got to have a purpose behind it so when you bring people into a room um, the landscape of say an environment needs to be able to cater to a particular need or several needs and um, you're all there to keep each other on track so our CTIO function is very vast we have technical specialists for uh, like applications people working with AI people working in cyber um, but then we also have the blend of product owners people that are div diversifying the roadmap linking in with the business we've got all the things that stretch into project management office to um, technical delivery and so it's really vast in what it can offer 
And I think the partnership there is how do you bring people in together to deliver? So how do you understand the, the needs that sit around it? So there's a lot of innovation there, but innovation is great when it has a purpose. It's going to facilitate something in the industry and somebody feels like they're part of it. So um, I think tech in the workspace or working in tech is more than just being, I have to be a, a technician, or I have to know a language, I have to know, I have to have all these pre um, determined qualifications or skill sets to do it. You just need common sense, you need to be problem solving, um, and I think that's really important. Um, the career landscape is really interesting. There's multiple career pathways, and I think ev not everybody gets an opportunity to be part of an apprenticeship program or part of a graduate program. They're really useful. They give you the opportunity to experience a wide range of different areas that sit within that space. Um, and a lot of the time, they can then help you specialize, and they can give you the framework. Um, but a lot of what we can do in terms of career pathways is advise um, new talent and foster new talent to know that there are ways to work in the industry and get to where you need to be. And actually to be well-rounded as an individual and deliver on that, you could end up going down a very different career pathway, just getting your foot in the door. You know, if you want to be really technical, um, but there's a, an opportunity in products or there's an opportunity in service desk, they're actually great avenues and they will help you and help uh, foster new age talent to think outside of the box because they understand different needs outside of particular, particular their specialism. And the great thing about technology is it's a range of people. Um, you can be, you don't, you can go up the ranks and not be a people manager, which is a lot of what is the prescriptive um, way of going and getting promoting and having a career. So. Um, SME doesn't happen overnight, you, you learn continuously, you do understand your talents, you understand where you add value, and that can change as well throughout your career depending on your exposure. So, you know, I think for me as well, working in tech and thinking about how you work in academia is about opening the mindset that people have, anybody has the potential. It's not just about technical innovation, it's how you get people into a room to define that value and bring that value to the space. And that diversity is really, really important. Thank you, Alex. Um, I know we're going to pick up, he says, looking meaningfully at Jason about micro-credentials and short courses and so on, because I think that allows you to address the things you're talking about there of building your career over time and then before you opt for something a bit more formal. Um, but, but turning to something a bit more formal, I'm going to ask um, um, Tara to talk a little bit about widening participation. I mean, that's a really key thing if we're going to close the skills gap. So Tara, could you mind talking a little bit about degree apprenticeships, what it looks like in Wales, and in particular how employers can get into the scheme, please? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, well, we've been doing degree apprenticeships in Wales since around about 2018. Um, they come on board in England first, back in sort of 2013, but in 2018, obviously we started work on them in Wales because we saw the success as well that they've been bringing over the border. Um, initially, in 2018, the initial work was done on sort of what, what they classed as the current priority areas. So the first two frameworks to be developed were digital and engineering. Um, so they've been running. We started our first one in Cardiff Met in 2019, um, and they've been running since then. And predominantly, when we started running um, our first digital apprenticeship, which was data science, we were working with um, the government, really. They were our main partner, and we were working to train data scientists in the government. But to be honest with you, over the last couple of years, it's really expanded and captured a lot of the um, technology companies in, in South Wales and obviously throughout Wales as well. So it's very much a growing area, I would say. Um, and our biggest challenge is, in terms of um, looking at widening participation as well, is getting more vacancies out there generated, new vacancies. Because what we're seeing to date is lots of employers are sending existing staff through, which is great because it's offering them the opportunity to upskill and to gain degrees and develop their skills. But we get a lot of approaches from um, people who are leaving school and college and things, and they, they really are looking at this as a viable route now to come through it rather than going to full-time university. They want to come to us as an apprentice. Um, so, yes, so degree apprenticeships, the current status is we've still got two frameworks in Wales, which is digital and engineering. Um, 
we are about to move into construction as well, um, which is a, a new one coming on board. And also um, the Welsh Government in sort of the last six months have just given us the OK now to start considering new frameworks. So working, you know, to develop new courses in different areas, new um, pathways under the existing frameworks. And we're doing some work with the government around that as well. Um, and that brings us really to where we are at the moment. Thank you, Tara. Um, so that, that's degree apprenticeships, I guess, um, of, of importance to employers is how to attract talent to their, um, their teams through more traditional routes. So I'm going to turn to Nick now. And Nick, could you clearly, um, you know, if you don't want to take advantage of a degree apprenticeship, could you talk to us a little bit about um, how you engage with employers to, to bring people in? Uh, yeah, of course. Thanks, John. Um, so my biggest recommendation to any employers here who are looking to, to target top talent is to not leave it to the last minute, not leave it to when students are in their final year. Um, Cardiff Met, like all universities, we have our jobs boards. You can register, you can pop an advert up and you can, you know, that might work, it sometimes does. Um, but to really increase your chances of success, we really recommend um, engaging early with us as a university and engaging with our students nice and early. Um, all of you will have you know, your ways of reaching out to, to students and potential recruits. You'll have your own profiles, but we've got a multitude of different ways um, at Cardiff Met for organizations and employers to engage with our students, to grow that profile, to grow their brand, and hopefully get a bit of understanding of the talent landscape that's out there. So for example, and I'm not suggesting at all by any means, you, know, you don't need to go out that first freshers week, uh, with, which we've just had at Cardiff Met. You know, we know students need that time to, to settle in at university. However, certainly, even from first year, midway through first year, there'll be ways and means within the curriculum, within teaching programs, and co-curricular and extracurricular um, for employers to get involved. So if I can start off with um, looking at just getting involved with the, um, within the curriculum and within teaching, um, I've been at Cardiff Met for just over two years now, but one of the things I've been really impressed by is the amount of um, theory, sort of putting theory into practice that the programs have and getting involvement and engagement from, from industry. So I know in CST and the teaching programs, there's a big emphasis on getting organization employers to feed into the curriculum, to set some project briefs or real world problems so that students can have experience early on in terms of how they can look to apply uh, some of the knowledge that they've attained from teaching um, into some uh, real life applications. So that can be a brilliant way. It can be a two way process with um, sort of benefits on both sides in terms of organizations will be able to see what the uh, students are like, the graduates of tomorrow are gonna be like, give them a bit more of an understanding and then hopefully start to establish connections that when the students are looking for full-time work or graduate work, um, there is a bit more of a footfall, a foothold, sorry. Being part of the curriculum can be a great way of engaging with students at scale. And then what I like to think about in terms of your recruitment pipelines is how you can um, maintain contact or keep engagement going on um, with students. So let's say that you've um, been part of a, a teaching sort of se seminar or session. Um, you've been out to, you know, I'm not going to try and guess how many students you've got on some of the undergraduate programs in CST, but you've been out in front of a good number. Then perhaps you might want to think about short-term work experience. These can be internships or um, one of my specialisms is credit bearing placements. And these can vary between um, sort of about sort of 40 hours or just over a working week to something um, a bit longer. I think Aldermore have, have sort of, you know, you've been working in this space a long time in terms of the sort of established placement opportunities and placement schemes. You know, people here may have done it as part of the industrial placement years or sandwich placements. And, you know, those can be fantastic ways of getting students in, helping them try to understand the um, company culture and, and brand, some of the sort of work that's available, and then hopefully, you know, see if it's right, going to be, they're going to be a right candidate for you for the future, as well as for the candidate to see if you, they're going to be right for you as, a, as an employer. And I loved what you were mentioning, Alex, about, you know, once you've got a foothold in a company, you know, there are so many sideways moves and it doesn't, it's not going to be a linear progression. And we've seen that even with 12 month opportunities, you know, we have students who are out on placement now who are, you know, rotating sort of three months in one area, three months in another to really give them that exposure to, to different elements of the business. Um, you know, you may think of, remember how you were sort of when you were sort of embarking upon your careers. I know it was for me, I had no idea what I wanted to do um, when I was starting university or even in the final year or probably even now. Um, but one of the ways we really try to um, educate our students about what's out there is to start getting them involved and, and placements and internships can be a great way to do that. 
Alongside those um, work experience opportunities and, and getting involved with the curriculum, we of course do the very traditional sort of milk round elements of um, getting employers onto campus. Um, I think you know for all of us, the pandemic was a, was a really tough time. But you know, one of the perhaps less priority sort of um, concerns, um, but still quite significant, was you know for a couple of years we weren't able to have organisations and businesses onto campus, you know, engaging our students on on home turf, as it were, and that can be a brilliant way for for businesses to again reach out, begin conversations with um, students, and then hopefully see where that may progress in future. We've got our um, big careers fair at Cardiff Met. That's coming back uh, for the first time since 2019 next Tuesday. So it was great to see um, a couple of the exhibitors here today, like PwC and Welsh Water, who are going to be coming onto that and engaging with our students. Um, so we're really hoping that'll be a good launch pad for uh, lots of the organisations there to then hopefully take forward some, some further levels of engagement. So hopefully through sort of those little snippets, I've given you a bit of an idea in terms of what is out there. Um, again, biggest recommendation is just to try and engage as early as you can. We can at a push, obviously. We know projects come up and new business can be won. And, you know, you may be looking for someone on a short term, um, sorry, in a quick sort of short space of time. But if you are able to think strategically and look to work, you know, think a couple of years ahead, that can be a really rewarding way for both yourselves as employers, but also for the, the quality of the workforce that you'd be looking to, to enrol, hopefully. Thanks, Nick. That's uh, very comprehensive. We've taken some of Jason's thunder, but... <laughs> so the, the danger of going last, Jason. Sorry for, for treading on toes. Jason, Jason, would you mind picking up on particularly the industry involvement in curriculum? Um, yeah, 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 further, yeah, yeah. Well, what, what Nick just said um, is pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, it, it's very important for us as a school to, to get a lot of input from industry into the way that we deliver the curriculum. Um, one of the one of the problems that, that we've got um, as as a school, um, a, te a technical school, is to to put into context sometimes the things that you, we are teaching the students. Because a lot of the time, some of the time, um, where we teach, the students will ask, "What's the point of doing this? Why am I doing this?" And we need that industrial input to come in and say, "Well, you're doing this because it's important." So it's important for the students to understand the fundamentals of what they're doing. I used to teach SQL years ago, um, and the students were always like, well, you know, this is interesting. What's the point of it? And it's not until we went on a trip to Eindhoven, and we went to a factory, and the factory was powered by SQL. And then they had that light bulb moment, and they went, oh, yeah, I get it now. I understand. But it's things like that that motivate the student. So as Nick was saying, we invite people in um, to give guest lectures. We get industry involved in um, setting authentic assessments. Um, we try and make or try and bring in as much as possible industry into the community. We're still a relatively young school, but nurturing and developing that community and making industry a significant part of that is really important for us. It's really important for us in, to ensure that we keep the curriculum current and it just gives the students that context of what they are learning and the importance of it so it just helps to, to to have that involvement in everything that we do and the students then have the opportunity of course of going out to do work experience that is a game changer a huge game changer for our students pretty much all the students that come back after after a year's work experience end up graduating with a first class degree because they can take the first two years of their degree, apply it, and then come back and, and essentially ref reflect on it in the final year and put into practice what they've learned in industry and in the previous two years. So there's a lot of benefits, a lot of pluses from us working with industry and working very closely with our students and developing their growth mindset as well, making them realize that there's a lot of soft skills out there that they need to, to make use of and apply that with a technical skill as well because the two go hand in hand. And that's what we start very, very early with our degrees, is that we explain that to them. The technical stuff is as important as the soft skills, the professional skills. If anything, I think the professional skills are a little bit more important because they can apply the technical stuff with the soft skills that they develop over the first couple of years with us. Thanks, Thank Jason. You. Yeah, so um, I'm, I've just got an eye on the time here. There's one facet we haven't looked at. We've looked at the kind of traditional pipeline of students uh, entering whatever vehicle they choose and then, and then leaving and getting a job. But 
SMEs, for example, um, might not be in a position to take on employees and perhaps want to partner with someone initially uh, to access expertise they need in the short term. So what universities also do, of course, is research and innovation services. So I'm, I'm going to stay with Jace. Uh, and, and if could you pick up on sure. how people can access um, the research and innovation services uh, to, to access grant opportunities and so on? Yeah, yeah. cheers, John. Um, the research that we do, we, we try to, as much as possible, align it with what is going on within research, sorry, within industry. Um, there's a lot of theoretical research that goes on in universities, but the stuff that I think really has the most impact is the stuff that you do with you guys in industry. Um, and there's a number of different platforms for us to, to use to be able to do that. Um, one, of, one of the first things that I think that is, is really useful to explore are smart partnerships, where you can develop specific projects with input from a number of different stakeholders. So we had a really nice um, smart partnership um, in data science, and we worked with the people who look after Broad, not Broadhaven, Steepholm Island, one of the two islands, yeah, flat, flat home, that's the one, flat home <laughs> island. Um, Look, looking at, looking at the, the data there with the movement of, of, of birds and animals there, and then we worked with them to visualize that using data science, and we, we presented that then um, down in TechniQuest. TechniQuest. Um, so that worked really, really well, where we developed a project with a number of different stakeholders. Um, so that was, that was a really good example of that. We've also got things called knowledge transfer partnerships, um, where we identify an individual to work with a company, so we, we embed that person within the company, but they've also got the support then from the people in academia as well um, to develop a project specifically for them. So that is partly funded by the government and partly funded by yourselves. Um, so that is a 50-50 approach then to, to KTPs. We've also got consultancy, where you can work on different projects, specific projects funded from different, um, different places. Um, so that works particularly well. Um, and we've also got training and micro-credentials that Tara just touched upon earlier on, where we can put together a training package for you. We've got a number that we've just putting through at the moment. Um, a lot of interest in data science and a lot of interest in computer security as well. So there's a lot of different avenues there that we can explore in tying up res our research with the things that you do within the industry to have that impact of, of, of those projects then where we apply them in the real world. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. So uh, we've kind of covered skills in the round there, you know, from the traditional skills of people you're going to, you want to employ uh, and then accessing it on a more um, ad hoc, bespoke basis to support applications for grants, working with industry and so on. Um, so that's kind of, I, I've got many more questions I was going to ask the panel members, but they've all answered the ones I asked so fully I think it's probably time for me now to, to take questions from the floor. Don't, don't be shy. <laughs> if, if there are no questions, I can go to some of my backup questions. Alex, go, I know you had another, a bit more to say. Um, that's all right, I'll, I'll just quickly talk while you think about the next question. <laughs> um, I just want to say I'm a big, um, from my perspective, working in industry, working in banking and finance, I'm a big advocate for this, these, this relationship that we have with Cardiff Met. And, and for us, the way we're trying to, it's not really revolutionized, but it is, it is kind of in that, that phase, is, is, is it's not just about tech strategy, it's people strategy. So you can't deliver a tech strategy without your people. Um, so when we're looking at the skill set deficit, as it were, and it's looked at quite from an analytical perspective, um, it really is about pathways and building alongside the technology, not trying to also bring in um, skill sets as they stand in now. It's about evolving that and involving the work practices that sit behind it. You could have really skilled technical expertise come in. Um, that's needed, but you also need the grounding to be able to manage that appropriately. So um, I'm a big advocate for um, apprentices coming in, people with limited experience, because it gives an opportunity for them to think outside the box, think of things in, from a different perspective, but they'll catch up very quickly. If there's challenges in the business where you have a technical kind of inclination of where you want to go, you've got a customer need that you want to hit, 
um, these sort of partnerships can expose a lot of different elements from expertise to guiding someone to be able to be um, industry leading in your area. So I've had two apprenticeship apprentices come in straight from school. Um, both started out within my team. Um, we're now, they're both still within the company. They're now four years in. They did their apprenticeship in 18 months. Um, one is a senior test analyst and is doing really big things with one of our key um, systems. And the other one is managing two major um, te technical operational teams. So there really is value in going through that transition phase to bring people into that space and bringing that expertise in as well. And I think in industry, we just we kind of want skill sets now. We want them delivered now. We want somebody to come in that's done it before. I don't think a lot of what's been happening has been done before, or probably not with the same setup of people. So um, just being open-minded to that and being able to kind of see it as an opportunity to develop your work ways of working by onboarding that into your um, sort of model, um, I think you'll see the outweigh of benefit for that. And when you talk about retention, um, you know, building expertise um, internally and with people coming in and thinking about academia, there is a real opportunity there to think forward and people strategize out as well as technically strategize. And I think that's all what we're kind of talking about today and, um, you know, being an advocate for that partnership, uh, for sure, my side. Thanks, Alex. I think you summed us up quite nicely there. Just the last chance for any questions from the floor? Okay, I'll, I'll just um, from, I'll just quickly thank my panel. Thank you. We've got many more questions here, but if you want to talk to people afterwards, but thank thank you for your full full answers. And I'll hand back to Sam. We're, on, we're perfectly timed, so that's really great. And and yeah, we are going to stick around. And there's the stalls outside as well. Like I said, to so feel free to mingle and, and chat as you as you are um, exploring the rest of the sessions. So yeah, enjoy your day. We're done in here for today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Enjoy. Take care. Bye. <laughs>